You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org, Medscape Cardiology. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape. You can now access the latest in medical news on your Amazon Alexa-enabled device. Join me, Perry Wilson, every weekday morning for Medscape Medical Minute, where I highlight the top medical stories of the day. To add Medscape Medical Minute to your flash briefing, search for Medscape Medical Minute on Amazon and click Enable. Or open the Amazon Alexa app, go to Skills, search for Medscape Medical Minute, and click Enable. Then say, Alexa, what's the news? Or, Alexa, what's my flash briefing? I hope you'll join us. Hi, everyone. This is John Mandrola from the Heart.org Medscape Cardiology, and this is This Week in Cardiology for September 16th, 2022. This week, the long-term safety of LDL lowering, analytic methods and trial results, sacubitril valsartan, SGLT2 inhibition, and patient selection for left atrial appendage closure. First up is LDL lowering the fourier Olay trial presented at ESC. Now, one of the unknown unknowns of massive LDL cholesterol lowering is that over time, there may be issues with muscle function, hemorrhagic stroke, or cognition. To be honest, in patients who have established atherosclerotic disease, I strongly suspect progression of occlusive disease would be a far bigger risk But it is true that the four-year trial of evolocumab versus placebo was only 2.2 years. Most patients treated with LDL cholesterol lowering, PCSK9 inhibitors, are going to get treated for a lot longer than that. At the ESC meeting, Professor Michelle O'Donohue from Harvard presented results of an extension trial of four-year called four-year Olay. I recall that in the original four-year trial, a little shy of 28,000 patients with established CAD and an LDL cholesterol greater than 70 on statins were randomized one-to-one to to evolocumab or to placebo. And evolocumab resulted in a 15% relative risk reduction in the primary endpoint was a composite of CV death, MI, stroke, unstable angina, or revascularization. In this trial, non-fatal outcomes drove the modest 1.5% absolute risk reduction. There were no significant differences in CV death or overall death. My take of the four-year trial and Odyssey trials of the PCSK9 inhibitors is that for young patients, these were 62-year-old patients who have established disease, there is is a modest effect in reducing non-fatal outcomes. The argument is not whether PCSK9 inhibitors work, it's whether the effect size on non-fatal outcomes warrants the cost. Fourier Olay set out to establish safety of the drug over time. They also looked at cardiovascular outcomes as well, but these were secondary endpoints. Fourier Olay was a non-randomized post hoc comparison. About 3,300 of the 14,000 patients, or 25% in each group, stayed in the extension study. Now, 75% of the two groups did not stay in the extension study. And both groups, both groups in Fourier Olay got the evolocumab. Think of the two groups as this way. One was evolocumab, evolocumab. In other words, it got the drug in the regular trial and then it extended uh, on evolocumab. And then this other group was placebo, evolocumab. And the main finding in the extension trial was that over five years of follow-up, In this small and selected sample of patients, there was no safety issues noted. No muscle-related, hemorrhagic stroke, diabetes, neurocognitive issues were identified. This despite getting the median LDL cholesterol down to 30, which is impressive. The finding that garnered the most attention, I think, at ESC was that the primary outcome of CV death, MI, stroke, unstable angina, and revascularization, and the key secondary endpoint of just CV death, MI, and stroke, favored the evolocumab evolocumab group over the placebo evolocumab group. The Kaplan-Meier curves kept diverging in the extension study for the first three years, though then in a landmark analysis, which looks only at years one through five of the extension study, the legacy benefit of evolocumab waned after three, three years. In other words, the placebo group that got the drug started to catch up. So the first thing to say is that I have come to believe that long-term exposure to LDL cholesterol is where the most benefit of this treatment lies. 
It makes sense, right? It's seen in statin trials, and it's confirmed in the Mendelian randomization studies. So the legacy effect wherein being randomized to evolocumab continues for two to three years, even when the comparator arm gets the evolocumab drug, that makes sense. And so I agree with the author's conclusion about this data supporting earlier use of LDL cholesterol-lowering therapies in young patients who have bad vascular disease. You want to get the cholesterol down, and you want it to be down for longer periods of time. Here are the caveats, though. While I would place the odds of a long-term safety signal as very low, I don't think this study does much to move that estimate for two reasons. One is that the median follow-up here was only five years. That's hardly very long for a 62-year-old. The worry with the cholesterol of 30 is not five years, it's 10 to 20 years. The other reason I'm not swayed by this analysis in terms of safety, safety is that it represents a fraction of the main trial. And it's a highly selective, non-random sample, and there's no longer a comparison arm. But again, to reiterate, the probability of a safety signal here, especially in patients with bad vascular disease, is quite low. As for the legacy effect, it is there too. For instance, if you did the same trial in a DOAC versus aspirin trial, there would be no legacy effect of the DOAC. But this effect was transient. By years four or five in Fourier Olay, there were no differences. The effect was driven mostly by non-fatal events. Now, the authors don't tell us about overall death in Fourier Olay, but I suspect that also is not different. It wasn't different in the main trial. So finally, my overall take is that if you have a young patient with terrible coronary disease who still has an LDL of greater than 70 on statins, and is, this patient is similar to those enrolled in the trials, for example, lots of heart disease, but not a lot of multimorbidity. And this patient wants to do everything possible to reduce non-fatal events and is willing to pay for and take the time to get these shots. PCSK9 inhibitors make sense. They'd make a heck of a lot more sense at a lesser cost, but that is a debate for policy and health economists, not a cardiology podcast. Next topic today is a reanalysis of the Paradise MI trial of Sacubitril Valsartan versus Ramipril in post-MI patients. Before I tell you about this post hoc analysis of Paradise MI, presented as a hotline at ESC, let me remind you of what happened last week in the post-PCI trial of surveillance stress test versus standard care. Post-PCI found a 10% reduction in a MACE endpoint in the active arm but it was not even close to statistically significant because the confidence intervals went from a 39% benefit to a 35% harm. In other words, there were too few events to discern signal from noise, like flipping a coin 10 times and trying to decide if seven heads, three tails indicates a biased coin. You need 100 or 1,000 tosses, not 10. Well, another thing that statistics professor Frank Harrell always talks about is getting the most use of data from trials. In the post-PCI trial, like many trials, they used a time to first occurrence of the event. Professor Harrell thinks this ignores lots of good information. Some of the heart failure with preserved DF trials, for instance, use total heart failure events. This has the effect of increasing the number of coin tosses, the number of events. At ESC, Investigators presented a reanalysis of Paradise MI using a statistical technique called the win ratio. It's a complicated endpoint, but the take home is that its proponents say it incorporates more of the data that is collected. Now, recall that the original Paradise MI trial randomized patients within days of an acute MI. These patients had an EF of less than 40% and or pulmonary congestion and at least one other risk-enhancing factor like older age, CKD, AFib, etc., one group got sacubitril valsartan, the other group ramipril. There were no run-in periods. The primary endpoint was first occurrence of CV death, heart failure hospitalization, or outpatient development of heart failure. And over a median follow-up of 23 months, there was a 10% reduction of the primary endpoint with sacubitril valsartan, but the hazard ratio of 0.90 had conference intervals that went from 0.78 to 1.04, and the p-value was 0.17. This was definitely a neutral trial. The investigators 
then published another post hoc analysis in Circulation 2022, which I'll link to. This analysis focused only on investigator reported events rather than clinical event committee adjudicated events. There were more events in this analysis, more coin tosses, and the hazard ratio was slightly better at 0.85. And now the confidence intervals were tighter, and then this post hoc analysis met statistical significance. This analysis gives one the clue that had the trial used more of the data, there might have been a small advantage of Sacubitrol Valsartan. The other point to make is that the time to first events are usually dominated by non fatal events, but you really also want to know about fatal events. The objective of this new win ratio analysis was to provide an additional perspective into understanding the effects of sacubitril valsartan in post-MI patients who have LV dysfunction. The investigators used a win ratio analysis, which considers a hierarchy of outcomes. That is, the most serious events are given higher priority and are analyzed first. They also investigated the difference in the analysis when looking at events that were reported by investigators versus the events that were confirmed by the Clinical Events Committee. The win ratio considers wins versus losses in each of the three components of the primary endpoint, and here it was CV death, heart failure hospitalizations, or outpatient heart failure visits. And for each matched pair, the new treatment patient is labeled a winner or a loser depending on who had the CV death or heart failure hospitalization or outpatient heart failure visit first. The win ratio is the total number of winners divided by the total number of losers. It's a ratio, and here it was 1.17, conference intervals 1.03 to 1.33, which was statistically significant to a p-value of 0.015. So the win ratio favored Sacubitril Valsartan, and I know that sounds complex. But the other thing the investigators did was tell us what were the main contributors to the wins or win ratio. And here it was CV death of clinical endpoint committee confirmed events. These contributed more than a third of the wins. And this is important, I think, because a confirmed CV death is indeed the hardest endpoint. The advantage of this technique over the time to first event is that it incorporates more information. In time to first event, you get a heart failure hospitalization. That's it. In a win ratio, the same patient can contribute a heart failure hospitalization and a CV death. Okay, at ESC, Professor Berwanger, Otavia Berwanger from Brazil, was very careful in saying that this analysis was directed at trialists. He started by saying Paradise MI remains a neutral trial. This analysis does not cha change guidelines, nor should it change clinical practice, and I say good on him for emphasizing this. And I sort of wear two hats here. The hat that loves methods and trials and evidence really appreciates this analysis. Indeed, we should have methods that get the most out of these human experiments. And to a novice stats person, the win ratio makes a lot of sense because we do care more about preventing a death than, say, a heart failure hospitalization. But that said, I'm not so persuaded by their emphasis on investigator-reported events. I mean, a clinical events adjudication committee is there to adjudicate and make sure the events are real. They don't tell us a win ratio for only clinical endpoint adjudicated events, and I wonder if that win ratio would have been as positive as the one that included investigator-reported events. Now, this reminds me of a super cool paper, and it's been a while, but remember back to the Brian Nosek paper that showed how results can be dependent on analytic methods. Nosek recruited 29 teams to analyze one data set to answer one question, and the 29 teams of these data scientists used more than 20 different methods, and two-thirds of the time, they found significant results, and one-third found non-significant results, and I'll link to my column on that paper. So when you have a trial results that are close, as they were in Paradise MI, an analytic method may be toggled back and forth between significance and non-significance. The thing is that you have to pre-specify what methods you're going to use before the experiment. And these post hoc analyses, once you know the results, can only be used to generate ideas, I think, for other trials. And Nosek talked about a multiverse method of analyzing data. This means that you can analyze a data set 20 or more ways and then synthesize the results. That seems awfully hard to do for, say, a clinical trial, but it, it does seem to me that it would get closer to the truth. 
Now, the other hat I'm wearing when I hear this is my skeptical or maybe even cynical hat. Now, if this were for trialists more than clinicians, why wouldn't we present this at a statistical or epidemiology conference? And yes, ESC has basic science, but the thrust is for clinicians. And so here you have a hotline presentation that could be interpreted like this. Hey, docs, Paradise MI was almost positive for sacubitril valsartan, but when we use this better statistical technique, it is positive. Now, Professor Berwanger was clear in his words that this wasn't the right interpretation, but still, it's a favorable analysis for an expensive drug at a hotline at ESC. And in hospitals, at least here in the U.S., there's not as much scrutiny of who gets prescribed drugs, so I worry, despite Professor Berwanger's warning, that this will help create a new therapeutic fashion. Okay, third topic is SGLT2 inhibitors after myocardial infarction. And I want to first say that I love trials and I love when doctors put things to the test and investigators in Austria, first author Dirk von Lewinsky did just that in the EMI trial. So right off the bat, kudos to the investigators for doing a trial. EMI was a double-blind, placebo-controlled trial of the SGLT2 inhibitor empagliflozin, and it was started in the hospital within three days of an acute PCI for MI. This is an important space to study SGLT2 inhibitors. The drugs are proven beneficial in diabetes, CKD, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, and there's an arguable degree of benefit in patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. But the post-MI space is another area that these drugs might help. However, however, there are hurdles. The main one is that our treatments here are so good. Acute PCI preserves LV function. It prevents heart failure. So it's already hard to improve on that. I just discussed paradise MI in which patients had a bad ejection fraction and yet sacubitril valsartan had no significant effect over ramipril. ME trial used BNP as a primary endpoint. It measured EF and diastolic parameters by echo as a secondary endpoint, and the results were positive, but modest. There was a 15% lower BNP at 26 weeks in the EMPA arm. There was a statistically significant but very small change in EF at 26 weeks. Same with diastolic parameters. They were a bit better in the EMPA arm. Again, the mean ejection fractions here were normal, so I'm not sure how you improve on normal. And the trial had way too few outcome events to make any kind of analysis on. Some brief comments. Journalist Patrice Wendling has an excellent news recap. Please take a look at it. I think this class of drug has real value in selected patients. I use SGLT2 inhibitors often. That said, before we start using them in a totally new indication like post-MI patients, we're going to need outcome trials. Remember, no one knows how SGLT2 inhibitors work. They just do, right? They reduce events. So anything short of clinical outcomes in this drug class is not going to be super helpful. An EMI is a great effort, but a 15% decrease in BNP at 26 weeks and modest changes in echo parameters are like mile one of a marathon. And I'm seriously unsure you can make acute MI patients who have PCI and a normal EF much better with anything in the short term. Yes, of course, we use statins, antiplatelets, lifestyle changes, ACE and ARBs. But even beta blockers in this setting are questionable. There are ongoing trials looking at beta blockers in the modern era. I worry about overuse of SGLT2 inhibitors when there is a minimal clinical gain because money spent on low value care is money not available for basic health care. Patrice tells us about the ongoing DAPA-MI and IMPACT-MI trials, which will test whether DAPA or EMPA respectively can lower the risk for heart failure hospitalizations and death in patients who have cardiac dysfunction after MI. And IMPACT-MI will additionally evaluate patients with preserved EF but new and acute signs of heart failure in the setting of MI. If they show an important and statistically robust decrease in clinical outcomes, I will change my mind. Okay, next topic is left atrial appendage occlusion or closure patient selection. Jackie P. has published an important observational study of patients who received percutaneous left atrial appendage occlusion. The first author is Jules Mesnier. The study included more than 800 patients from centers in Spain, Italy, and Canada 
over a 10-year period from 2009 to 2019. The goal was to investigate the causes of early death after appendage closure. The mean age of these patients was 76. Here's why it's an important question. If you believe there is a net benefit from this procedure, I don't, but let's say you do, it takes time for this to accrue. Proponents of left atrial appendage occlusion believe that the combination of plugging the appendage and removing oral anticoagulation will lead to fewer major bleeds and no increase in strokes. But these sort of probabilistic benefits take years to outweigh the probabilistic harms of the procedure. And even the Watchman authors themselves published a paper saying it took five years for this procedure to reach cost efficacy. So if patients die soon after the procedure, they can't possibly garner any probabilistic gain. So what these authors showed was that one in six, or 15.5% of patients in their series died within the first year. And they also did a regression and found typical risk factors for early death, older age, underweight, diabetes, heart failure, CKD. And patients who had three or more of these risk factors had a 30% chance of dying in the first year. Boy, this kind of paper really worries me. In my first debate on left atrial appendage closure at ESC against Horst Sievert from Germany, even he admitted in the Q&A that older patients with multimorbidity were least likely to benefit from this procedure, which makes perfect sense, right? Because these patients are going to have a higher risk of upfront complications. Then they have multiple competing causes of stroke beyond just the left atrial appendage, and they probably have a higher rate of bleeding with antiplatelet therapy. And my experience locally and amongst U.S. colleagues is that older patients with comorbidities are commonly referred for and implanted with a left atrial appendage closure device. In fact, I was part of a poster at ACC that found Medicare beneficiaries undergoing percutaneous closure of the appendage have higher comorbidity burden, thromboembolic risk, and prior bleeding events compared to patients who were enrolled in the pivotal trials that led to FDA approval. And the authors of this observational analysis in Jackie P. chose strong words in their closing. They wrote that patients who have early death after appendage closure have had a futile procedure. Now, some may disagree with that wording, but I don't, because the whole point of this procedure is to provide a probabilistic benefit in the distant future. If there is no significant future because of early death, there can be no benefit. And worse than futile... The patient with early death after appendage closure still incurs the risk of harm from the procedure. Again, I don't think the seminal trials suggest benefit from this procedure in any patient, but obviously many of you disagree, so I say at least please choose patients wisely for this procedure. So that's it for this week in cardiology. As always, I'm grateful that you listened. Thank you. And remember, if you like this podcast, please take the time to give us a rating. Even a one or two sentence review goes a long way to helping others find us. Until next week, this is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology. You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape.